you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. I have to tell you, I'm excited to I'm always excited to speak to people, you know, as by now. But I have to say to you, I'm, I'm, I'm quite excited because I've got an offer here and we're talking about his new book, which is coming out, I believe, on the 17th of August. That's when you people can start buying it. And of course, we do expect you to support our guest. And he's a former Special Forces member. And he also uh, worked in private security after that. His name is Johan Roth. And he will be speaking to us in Afrikaans as well as in English, mostly English because he writes in English. There's a little bit of Afrikaans in between. I understand his new book is called The Breed the Park. But let's ask the offer. He's here with us. Uh, Johan, very welcome. Thank you. I really appreciate you. He also said to me there's going to be a launch, a formal launch, uh, in all the provinces in South Africa in the future. Uh, we will let you know when that happens. Whenever that happens, a week before, two weeks before, we will inform you. We'll bring him back by God's grace and he will explain to us where this launch will take place. You can go there. There will be like the other reconnaissance members who will also be there. You'll be able to speak to these people. And yes, if you've been following uh, Legacy Special Forces playlist, you know these people are indeed a breed of uh, They are different. Uh, let us not joke about that. So, you are very welcome over to you. Can you tell us where do you come from? How did you end up in the Army, uh, your Special Forces career? Hello, Chris. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. I enjoy it. Um, enjoy talking to you. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's been a long road. Um, you know, the conclusion of this book, uh, I was interested in going to, the, of course, we all had to do national service. I was very keen on it. And um, I learned about the Rekis from, uh, you know, stories from my father and from friends of his. And we've heard, you know, about these uh, special guys, uh, South African Special Forces. And it stirred the interest in me. So when I was called up, uh, when I was 16, um, I indicated that I would like to try Special Forces, um, you know, the selection and the pre-selections and everything else, and then the training, hopefully. And uh, lo and behold, they called me up to Oatshorn to uh, uh, infantry school. And um, yeah, that's where we started off. Um, I was there for 10 days and the pre-selection team came around and I was selected. I was still 17 and we went to Durban where we did, did basic training in the Rekis, which is quite unheard of. There was only five occasions in the 50 years of the Rekis um, existence where they presented uh, basic training to, to, to troopies fresh out from school because of a need in the 1980s. Um, my occasion was the third such one and um, I'm, I'm very grateful and you know it was an honor for us to do basics in the Rekis. So the story begins there. Um, you know, I was born in Bloemfontein in the Free State. And, um, you know, we got on a train, went to Oatshorn and from there to Durban. And the book goes about the journey and uh, all the phases from basics, seeing that, you know, it, it was only on a few occasions that people did basics in the Rekis. So the story goes about the Rekis, in the basics in the Rekis. And then uh, from there on the different courses that you had to partake in to get to... Um, the selection phase, the main selection phase, which is quite a, a, a grueling and, you know, difficult phase. And once you've passed that, you go on to complete the rest of the year, your um, special forces combat training, which includes a lot of uh, different um, uh, chapters, you know, like water orientation, um, know your enemy, parachuting, demolition, survival, um, unconventional warfare, bush warfare, urban warfare, it's a year-long uh, process that we call a cycle, a training cycle. And then at the end of the training cycle, if you survive all the different uh, courses, because, you know, even if you pass special forces selection, which is the toughest part to pass, um, you can still fall off, you know, injuries. And also you, you, you might not make some of the courses, which is difficult, for example, the parachuting and the demolitions. Um, and you might fall off and you might not make it. And then once you've done all the training, um, there's still a board, a, a selection board that sits and evaluate your year-long um, uh, performance that you did. And if they detected something, even though if you passed all the courses, if they detect that you're not a team player or you're unfitting into the commandos and um, 
you know, there's something that they're worried about, they might turn you down. And it happened on our course where two of our good buddies made it, the whole training through the year to the end of the year. And at the end of the year, they were turned away and they never qualified as special forces operators. So this book is about the year-long training of a South African Special Forces operator in detail through stories, though. It's not a, it's not a technical manual. We tell you all the weaponry we've used. We've tell you, we tell you about a lot of tactics and techniques we've been trained in by through stories. So um, hopefully this will now allay a lot of rumor and a lot of speculation about how we are trained and, and what we do to become Rekis. And uh, yeah, it, it, it was good fun. Um, putting it together because it happened 36 years ago, but fortunately, you know, I got hold of most of the guys on the on the cycle, and we formed a, a chat group. And the, so the story started coming around. You know, one guy remembers this, another guy remembers that. We all got memories that's in, imprinted in your in your brain, because it 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 was quite tough training, and it's something that you won't easily forget. And so, you know, one memory leads to the next, one guy's memory wake up another guy's memories. And so we mapped out the story. I couldn't have done it on my own. Um, I'm thankful to my cycle, to my buddies from uh, 8601, Special Forces Course 8601, um, for helping me mapping out the story and fleshing it out. But it was good fun. And, you know, I realized afterwards that it was quite a mission to become a South African Special Forces soldier. it um, You know, once you've completed something in life and you look back on it, it's okay. You know, you've made it. So it sounds easy and you can say it's not that bad, but it was tough. And um, for the right reason, so, you know, we we, we had to be the, the, the cream of the crop, the top soldiers on the continent, you know, in the world. And it had to be tough and it was tough. So this book will explain exactly what we went through and the processes involved in creating a Special Forces soldier. In a nutshell. And then I also wrote, you know, one or two chapters afterwards, Life in the Rekis in the book, you know, how we lived in the units. Uh, a lot of guys has written about operations that they partook in. But, you know, I gave the uh, the, the reader uh, um, a taste of how we lived in the units, our accommodation, our building where we worked in, our team rooms, um, the type of work we did, the training we did when we were not on operations. Um, you know, the RSM's parade and, you know, a few funny stories that happened around in the units. So people will get a good feeling of what it was like for us to serve in a special forces unit. You know, your day-to-day -day routine, um, your deployments, your, your you come back, you demobilize, that kind of thing. So I think they will find that interesting too. But the main focus was on on the training that we received during a year period, which we call a cycle. So, yeah, that is uh, in a nutshell. Then, you know, there's quite a lot of photos. We've got over 100 photos that's never been seen before. Um, and we've got a color uh, photo section as well. Um, you know, the photos were few and far between in the old days. Um, we were not allowed cameras on training cycles and in special forces. But, you know, guys do sneak it. And the instructors took a, a photo shot here and a photo shot there. Um, and I'm grateful for that. So we unearthed these, and uh, there's quite a few of them in the book. Um, you know, also showing the training that we've done, um, especially on the survival and the bush warfare phase. There were quite a few photos that came out, which will give the reader a good view um, of of what we went through. So um, I'm excited about that. And uh, yeah, the photo, the color photo section, I think came out great. So there's a couple of good color photos that also indicates, um, you know, what what we did. Well, I find this fascinating, Joanna. I wonder, let's talk about it early in this video. Uh, how much pages in this book and uh, what's the approximate cost? And I'm sure that there will also be some postage and things like that also. Yeah, so the book costs 285 Rand. That's the launch price. And I'm glad that the publishers um, could keep it under 300 Rand. I'm, I'm using the same publisher as I did with my first book, Blood Money which is Delta Books, and that's a division of Jonathan Ball Publishers, um, which is a great company, and I've really received good, you know, um, service from them. And they've done a few other uh, Reiki books as well, Quiz Toddler's book, Reiki, and they've done those Stain's book, um, you know, Iron Fist from the Sea, and they've also done the Reiki Cookbook, which which went down very well. So it's a professional outfit, and I'm happy for that. The book is around 300 pages. I think it's two pages shy of 300. And it takes approximately 10 hours to read, you know, if if, if you read um, 
fairly steady. Um, I've had good feedback so far. The the launch for the well, the the, the date that it will be available, as you said, is seventeen August on the shelves. But I've sent a few copies already to you know private people that wanted authorized uh, uh, signed you know signed copies, and uh, some of them started reading it. And some of them has finished it. They couldn't put it down. So I'm happy about the feedback that I received on it. Um, very well received so far. And uh, I hope it will continue. Are there any way that it's just in a limited number in paper so that people really have to now get to the party? And if so, can they pay up front? Do they have to wait till the 17th? Or can they perhaps contact someone and, and put a pre-order in for us? They can contact me directly and I can I can steer the process. Um, I will leave you with my email address, um, which I prefer to be contacted on. And uh, yeah, then, then we can take it from there. But um, if there's any hassle, I will help them to obtain a book, uh, you know, as, as, from a place close to them. Uh, our Special Forces uh, Organization, South African Special Forces Association, which we call SASFA, will also have books signed, author, you know, that, that I signed as an author, and that they will sell at events and at the offices in Pretoria. So um, we will also later on, when I uh, tell you about the, um, the launches and the Reiki story nights that we will probably arrange, which we did with the first book, then I'll give you that detail as well, where SASFA can be contacted or, you know, uh, go, to, go to the meetings or go to the story evenings, go to the launches, meet the guys. A lot of them can sign the book for you. The idea is to have launches in all the provinces. And um, it's normally in the, the form of a story evening where um, we invite guests. And then there's guys that was, you know, with you on, in this case, on, on the cycle, um, guys that served with you and trained with you, that we will sit down and, and tell stories about our training that is from the book and pertaining to, you know, operation or two that happened afterwards. Um, so, yeah, the, we I'm looking forward to that too. Fortunately, we've got um, you guys in most of the provinces that served with me and that did uh, the cycle with me. So we'll get them together and we'll tell a couple of lacquer stories and uh, then the people can meet them and, and get them to sign the books as well. I must also say, yeah, we've got the Reiki's 50th, um, 50 year anniversary this year. Um, one Reiki or the Reiki's was formed the 1st of October 1972 in Oatshorn uh, under the guidance of, you know, Colonel Jan Breitenbach. And uh, this year we will celebrate our 50 years um, uh, celebration in Pretoria. Um, and uh, that will be a big one. And I think it's already been on some radio stations and in the media. People need to keep an eye on that and they can come around and, and have a look there and meet a lot of the legends and buy a lot of the apparel. But I will also make the the, the finer details of that event available to you closer to the time. We're really grateful for that and we're looking forward. And I want to ask you, and I just must tell the audience here, I did ask you on to come back with a separate episode so that we can speak about his first book, uh, Blood Money. But if you can just... Give us a short background on that book as well. I'll be most grateful. Yeah. So what happened naturally is when we left the forces, um, you know, there was changes in 1989 after the Nine Day War. Um, you know, some of the Rekis were there with the Kufut guys, uh, the last insurgency that, that happened from Swapu site, and then there was peace, and it became Namibia, Southwest Africa. You know, the ANC was unbanned, and there was changes happening. Um, a lot of guys got you know, uh, retrenched, not really retrenched, but in the military as such, in general, um, there was a big shift of, of personnel. So a lot of guys left the forces and they started working internationally because obviously you're going to do something that you're good at and, and, and that you used to. And as soldiers, you know, the best thing for us that we could do was to go into the security sector um, and the private security sector specifically where there's high risk involved, where there's conflict zones, um, ex-war zones or an active war zone. This is the kind of thing that we've been trained for and where we can, you know, really uh, use our skills to assist people. So I first, you know, in, in the early 90s, I left the forces and I started working around Africa, uh, doing a bit of training, VIP protection, so on and so forth. And later on, this expanded. Um, I went to the, um, you know, Central America, um, looked after the president there for a while. And then I ended up in, in uh, the Middle East, in Iraq, where I worked for a 14 or over a 14 year period. 
Um, from 2004 till the end of 2017, um, I spent uh, around a decade on the ground. And my first book was about private military contracting, specifically in Iraq, because there was a lot of South Africans that went there, a lot of ex recis that went there. And people had a misconception about private military contracting and what we did there. You know, when people ask you, what do you do? You say, I work in Iraq. And they say, what do you do? And you say, no, I do security. And that's the end of the conversation. So I thought, no, it, you know, I first did it as a memoir. And then the guy said, no, well, let's turn it into a book. And then when people ask us what we do, they can read the book and see what we get up to. So that that book was was written with that in mind to explain to people what private military contracting is all about, the kind of work we did in Iraq, not only there, but of course, Afghanistan and Libya and Somalia and all these places. It's the same kind of work that you do. Um, and it also um, dispelled a lot of myth where people think that, you know, we crazed mercenaries and we go and fight wars and, and assist in, in, in you know, um, spilling blood. So I chose the, the name of the, the book Blood Money because obviously people would think, yeah, well, here's a bunch of mercenaries killing people for a living. But as actual fact, we went there to protect and to assist the U.S. military to free them up to go and fight so we did protection work of VIPs, generals, you know, airports, uh, convoys, uh, infrastructure, uh, power stations, and so on, so that the soldiers got freed up and they could go and fight Al Qaeda and the terrorists. You know, the U.S. military. It's a waste to put a combat soldier at the airport to stand guard. So therefore, they used ex-private um, military men from all over the world. But we also got attacked from all sides by the same terrorists that attacked the American soldiers. And we lost, uh, as a matter of fact, 40 South Africans in a period of about five years from 2004 till 2010 in Iraq. Um, so we got hammered and there were times that guys had to defend themselves, shoot back, kill insurgents. So, but we didn't go there. Uh, that wasn't the mission. The mission was to protect and to assist and to, you know, um, free soldiers up. But uh, yeah, we got attacked and, and guys had to fight back. So that whole story has been told in blood money. But, you know, private military contracting is a natural follow on for a guy that was in special forces, not only here, but all over the world. Um, you know, I met a lot of um, SEALs and Delta guys, SAS guys, Green Berets, guys that went into private military contracting once they've done or they retire or, you know, they leave the forces because it's a natural it, it, it's a natural kind of business that, that you will go into um, and use the skills that you were trained to do um, just in a different setting. Um, so that, that book explains that. But uh, this book, yeah, Breather Parts, actually the prequel. To it, you know, you get movies that come out, and then there's a prequel, and they explain where it started. This book is where it all started, where our skills come from, um, what we did in the Reiki, how we existed, and and then the, you know, from there we progressed on to things like private military contracting. I'm glad you're saying it's a prequel, and not a sequel, I suppose. Um, what might the training, your basic training of a Reiki, what would that have been different? from, say, a normal infantry uh, battalion, or uh, were you issued with light ammunition from beginning, higher standards of fitness? Yeah, so your standard of fitness had to be very high. and um, But, you know, I say in the book as well that, you know, if you had a, a good level of fitness, and, of course, you have to be medically very sound. They do all sorts of tests on you. Um, we did all sorts of, you know, kinetic and biokinetic tests, and they call it a Dynafit test, and this and that to see if your hips and your back and your legs can take the, the burden of what's going to come. But if you if you were medically fit and you were physically fit and you were um, fairly strong-minded, you could have made it up to a certain point but the main thing for us was the mental toughness you had to you had to have a lot of mental toughness um because they take your body to a point where you know normal endurance if, if you only rely on, on on normal human capabilities you probably won't make it you have to dig deeper and you have to mentally be able to overcome pain hunger thirst um interrogation all sorts of 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 difficulties that normal humans would just say no it's not worth it it's i'm fit i can run i can row i can swim but why is that necessary so the mental toughness was from the beginning um a main thing that that we got trained in and then of course during selection we've got psychologists there um watching you all the time watching for irritability can you work in a team um, can you overcome pain and hunger 
Um, they watch you like a hawk, and uh, rightfully so, because uh, afterwards, you know, you're going to go into some serious, um, difficult combat training and thereafter in operations. And that leads me to another point, you know, um, after blood money, a lot of people have spoke to me about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. And, uh, you know, I get asked that question a lot. And especially in Iraq, um, we saw a lot of gore and blood and beheadings and people blown up and so on and so forth. And of course, you see um, a lot of the Rekis that went into combat operations saw that as well, you know, um, attacks and people your buddies getting injured or killed um, next to you and they always ask you the first thing they ask you is are you bossy you know and and have you got uh, have you got nightmares and do you see things and so on and so forth and in the book I explained that from my point of view and my observation I haven't did, met one ex-South African special forces or Reiki soldier that has had such problems and I put it down to the fact that we were selected by psychologists we were very carefully selected um, to have a strong mind and i think because of that people could overcome it i've got no doubt that a lot of us and myself included you know has got flashbacks of things that happened that we saw a lot of blood and gore and things that that went down but we could process it i process it you think about it you get angry um, but you also make peace with it and you move on you don't let it get stuck like a needle on a long play record and it becomes a problem. Um, so, yeah, the selection process, I contribute the fact that, you know, there were a lot of mental observation of our capabilities that occurred during our selection. And I think that also um, helped us to, to for all the organization to pick people of strong minds that can deal with traumatic situations. I know that you did the selection course was the shorter one which I uh, think voted mm -hmm. Hassan brought back from Israel, which yeah. makes no difference. Even the, the guys from the old one says it's the same. It, the dropout rates are the same, the standards are the same. Yeah. But I also know that these instructors can be quite nasty. And I don't hold it against them. I think it's their job. That's what they do. They're good at it. But do you ever feel during the selection some kind of an anger towards these people or do you suppress such feelings? The okay, let me just backtrack. So the Reiki selections were two to three weeks in the in the seventies, um, but you must bear in mind that uh, with us to get to selection, you first have to pass um, special forces orientation, which is a thirty day course. It's a four week course. So if you don't pass that, you can't go on to selection, and there you also get drilled and hammered, and and that form part. I think of the old Reiki selection, they 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 did because you do weapons training, you do infantry training, you do platoon weapons, you know, like mortars and machine guns and RPGs and stuff, um, and and you get you get drilled hard and you get prepared to go to special forces selection. So, you know, the Delta Force guys in America before they do their selection, they go into the mountains of North Carolina and they do a thirty day, a hard training session where a lot of them fall off and it forms part of their selection. And so we must not forget that the guys that did the later on selection that is anywhere between four and six days, average of five days, first had to pass the 30 days prior to your selection course, which is at the same venue in Zululand uh, in those days at uh, the Duke uh, training facility. Um, and a lot of guys fell off then. And then you go on to selection. So the selection course um, that was devised is the clever people tell us, or, you know, sci scientists say, um, if if you don't break a guy in five days, you're not going to break him at all. And that's why that that uh, period of time was looked at between four and six days for the special forces selection, um, where they throw intense uh, exercises at you, where you don't get food, uh, you, you know, you malnutrition, you lose like 10 to 12 kilograms on a guy that weighs 80 kilograms in three to four days. Um, it's it's very intense. You get interrogated. You do exercises where you carry up to 100 kilograms on your back. Um, you do route marches. You do waterboarding. You have to do um, challenges. You know obstacle courses uh, towards the end when you're really tired and hurting and and you're hungry. Where they test your resolve and see if you can fix problems. Problem solving is 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 a big 
a part of special forces selection. All the time they will give you, they will show you diagrams and they will ask you things. They'll ask you to thread color coded uh, ropes through certain color coded blocks and things in a way to see if you can still focus when you are really being pushed beyond human limits. So problem solving is there all the time. The psychologists watch you all the time. Um, they drill you. The instructors are hard on you. Um, and they really make it tough. Um, you asked earlier about resentment. Um, the guys that showed any resentment or any um, irritability are the ones that got thrown off. So if you can't handle it, then then you get thrown off. You have to be able to absorb all this uh, hardship that that's thrown at you, and then still your brain has to function. Your your processor, your CPU, I always say, your central processing unit needs to be able to keep working under these harsh conditions. And that's what I think makes special forces soldiers different than a normal soldier is. The physical, yes, we can all carry a heavy backpack for a long time. We can all jump out of airplanes. We can all do fine movement in the infantry. But I think when it really um, matters, when when you when you're at your human limits, you must still be able to to process uh, thought, and you must be able to put that thought into action, and you must be able to work in a team, and you must be able to survive. And I think that's the difference with us and and normal infantry or paratroopers is is the fact that the mental part of it plays a big role, and that five day selection course tests your mental abilities to the absolute limits. And that's been um, in detail being described in the book, you know, what we went through and people can have a look. I think it's the first time that anybody's gone this deep into um, the process of selection exactly day for day, hour for hour, exercise for exercise that you do. Um, people talk about selection and survival and parachute training in other books, but they don't really give you the 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 inside story, the exact story, what happened. And this is what I wanted to put through. Uh, to the reader now in this book is exactly what we went through and how it was done and you know who made it and uh, how we proceeded for the rest of the year to get trained as um, special forces soldiers and uh, yeah as I said it was fun in writing the book but it wasn't as much fun when we did it it was hard it, it was really hard I got injured and I still carry those injuries to this day it's 36 years later but the reader can see in the book uh, what happened and, and yeah it, it, it's a tough challenge. Ons het een samenjorie gehad recht in die begin, skalk voor die, deze weer voor die, goeie vriend van my, uh, wat die, denk ek, in 1978 het hy die kering gedoen. Ja. En hy het, hy het altijd gesê, hy het gesê, hy het altijd slecht gevoel vir die ouwens wat afgegooi is van die kursus, want hulle was maar daar rond, hulle was nie onmiddellijk weggevat nie. So nou moet ek die vraag, op, op, die, op die kursus, is die ouwens onmiddellik net weggevat, hy sê, wat die excuse, ek kan nie meer nie, en hulle vat om weg, of, of hang hy maar daar rond? Um, die ouwens word teruggevat na die basis toe, na die opleidingsbasis toe, en doek en doek, en um, as jy beseer was, dan sal jy natuurlijk medische aandag kry, en as jy dit net die handdoek ingegooi het, dan sal jy nog steeds etes kry, en jy sal daar die basis aanbleid, tot die proces klaar is. Na die proces sal jy jou opbreek, um, die ouwens wat dit nie gemaakt het nie, sal terug aan Durban toe, en van daar af van hulle sal gehou word, dalk van ons groep ouwens was gehou gewees as drijvers, of as stoormanne, of as klerke, met hang af, um, jy weet van die behoefte, maar dan sal ook van hulle uitgeplaas word, van baie van hulle ouwens wat um, amper keer in klaar gemaakt het, of wat seer gekry het, en nie wou terugkom, nie is na die val, valskermbataljon toe, en hulle daar valskermsoldate geword, en van hulle het later teruggekom, toe hulle leiwe nou weer sterker was, en toe hulle kop en was, en so aan. So, en, en van hulle is infanterie toe ook. Meeste van ons het opgeroep gewees vanuit die infanterie, en, en die ouwens wat nie werk gekry het in die uh, rekkie eenhede nie, is dan terug na die infanterie toe, of na die uh, valskermbataljon toe. Maar ja, jy voel jammer vir hulle, jy weet, as ouwens wat jy nou lang wat mee geloop het, want jy het basis saam met hulle gedoen vir drie maanden, jy het een maand lang uh, spesmacht oriëntatie, opleiding met hulle gedoen, as vier maanden saam, en dan, jy weet, doen jy kering een paar dagen saam, en op die einde kry jy seer, of hy val af, of iets gebeur, maar dit het vir ons uh, ook in die jaar, jy weet, die gedurende die jaar het daar ons afgeval, dan sy 6-7 maanden saam met jy, dan val hy van demolities af, jy weet, um, miskien was die wiskundige berekenings net te moeilik vir seker ouwens, en recht op die einde, ons wat die hele pad geloop het, wat dan dier die beheerraad of dier die instructeerraad, jy weet afgekeer word, en hy krij nie sy, sy wapen nie, en hy die hele ding gedoen. So, sikke ons het dan altyd na infanterie enhede toe gegaan, um, en, en hy het goed gedoen, 
uh, je weet op hulle eie en in Velskern en Bataljon en, en plekke soos die padvinders en soan en sovoort, maar um, op die einde van die dag is dit hartseer as daar van die ouwens afval, maar dit is maar die proces, jy weet, hulle aanvaar het, ons aanvaar het, jy hou contact, hy jaar het jy maar briewe geskryf of ouwens gesien as jy uh, aan die eenheid toe gaan of ontplooi of goed is, maar die is daar die ouwens mekaar weer begin opkyk en ander gevat en pelle gemaakt, maar ja, Dit is maar die harde realiteit van die ding. Um, jy maak het of jy maak het nie. Maar hulle was daarom altyd goed en met respect gaan teer en, en, en hulle, jy weet, hulle, hulle is behoorlijke medische aandacht gegeen as het een besering was wat baie gebeur het. En um, ja, hulle is altyd weer een kans gegeen. Jy kon altyd terugkom en weer kon probeer het. En partij ons het dit gedoen, partij het geslaag, partij het een paar keer probeer en nooit geslaag nie. Maar ja, dit is die proces. Ek wil jy vraag hier teer die einde, speel geloof een rol is ook. Ja, ek dink uh, dit doen, en ek het dit so beskryf ook, uh, jy weet, in a, in a paar kere in, in my eerste boek en in die deen, uh, ou moet gloe in jouself, verseker, maar jy moet ook gloe in iets anders. Nou, um, vir my en vir jou is dit ook geloof, miskien is dit een sekere type, type van geloof, jy weet, daar is baie type geloof van recht oor die wereld af, ek sê nie die ene is beter as die ander ene, maar jy moet in iets geloof. En ek skryf ook in die boek dat as jy gevang word en ons praat van ontsnap en ontwijking en ons praat van, um, jy weet, as hulle jou gaan begin um, ondervra, interrogate, soos die Engelse sê, jou kracht, dan, dan moet hy ook diep gaan grawe en jy kan maar met ons praat wat, wat gesit het en wat deurgeloop het en wat, jy weet, dier die vijand ondervra is. Daar is wat jy nodig om in iets te glo, of het jouself is en of het jou vrou is en of het jou kind is en of het die hoer mag is, En, en of het uh, alomvattende God is, jy moet in iets geloo, want as jy nie geloof het in iets of in jouself nie, dan gaan jy dit nie maak nie. So ek sal sê geloof speel een baie groot rol in dit, um, ek sê nie wat sy geloof, jy moet kies nie, maar jy moet een geloof in iets hee. Well internet, we now at the end of this episode, we're going to see you on again, we're making a tribute episode to RSM, Pet van Seil, also known as Wim Pet van Seil, uh, you told me in private, yeah, he's got a lot of stories about that. It's going to be a fantastic episode. It's only being recorded end of August. It's got General Bowman of Special Forces, Ron Sporey, Johan himself. I believe there might be other people involved. And we're going to tell you about this remarkable man. Um, everybody I speak to in Special Forces mentioned Pet von Seil. And he was also, uh, also mentioned, funny enough, in the AP episodes which are coming up. For now, get out of this book. That's what I'm telling you people. Get out of this book. Contact you on directly. If you can't get out of you on, contact me. I'll, I'll put you in, in contact with him. Let us see if we can spread these books around as much as possible. You on will be back from time to time to tell us what's happening. And he will also come and tell us about his first book, Blood Money. I'm very interested in that one as well. You, know, you hear so many stories. It is dreadful, all the lies. That's why we're here. We expel lies. That's why legacy exists. So thank you for you, sir. We really appreciate you. And until we meet again, God bless and good luck. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate the, the, the opportunity to have spoken on your channel and all the best for you. And thank you. I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you very much. God bless you too.